What does cancer treatment research and this marine creature here have to do with each other? Well, back in the 1960s, scientists took this sea squirt from a coral reef and discovered it had a surprising property. An extract from it was found to fight some types of cancer, and this research helped create an anti-tumor agent called trabectidin. Today, it's synthesized in large quantities in labs and has proven effective in patients with advanced cancers. And it turns out that coral reefs are a drug development goldmine. Over decades, scientists have discovered all kinds of compounds from coral reef species that can treat things like cancer, arthritis, Alzheimer's, and bacterial infections. I think we can all agree this is pretty important stuff. However, nature's medicine cabinets, as they are called, are dying. Since the first known studies related to trabectidin, we have lost half of all the world's coral reefs. I know this sounds depressing, and it is, but bear with me for just a second. Due to a one, two, three punch of climate change, land-based pollution, and overfishing, half the world's coral reefs have perished in less than a century. And frankly, we are to blame. But that also means that we can be the ones to stop it. And while much more research is needed in general on coral reefs, we now know more about them than ever before. We know what we're doing to them, and most importantly, we know how we can save them. So is there still time to save coral reefs and the many benefits they give us? I'm glad you asked, because we're gonna talk about it. I'm Mike DiGirolamo, and this is Problem Solved from Manga Bay. Make sure to check out our additional videos and more coming like this on our YouTube channel by clicking subscribe. They are not rocks. They are not plants. Nope. Corals are actually animals. They belong to the same family as jellyfish. And in fact, their life begins in a similar way. Both jellyfish and coral come from these mushroom-like stalks called polyps. Every coral is formed out of hundreds of thousands of polyps that swim freely in the ocean until they attach to hard surfaces along the edges of islands or continents. Over the course of many years, these polyps grow towards the sunlight, and their skeletons create massive structures known as reefs. While coral reefs cover less than 1% of the seafloor, they support 25% of marine life. And that's why when you go snorkeling near one, you can find sponges, algae, crustaceans, and all kinds of fish. Basically, think of coral reefs as rainforests of the oceans. Even though corals are animals, many species have a symbiotic relationship with a kind of algae called zooxanthellae. This algae lives in the coral's tissues, and the coral and algae rely on each other to survive. And sometimes when corals become stressed, these polyps expel their algae and the reef takes on a stark white appearance. This is called coral bleaching. If the polyps go for too long without their algae, they can die. These bleaching events have become more and more frequent due to climate change heating up the oceans combined with other human-induced impacts. These events destabilize reefs, on which not only a million aquatic species depend, but also those of us on land. Coral reefs save us from the worst storms by buffering our shorelines against a whopping 97% of the energy from waves, storms, and floods. They provide food and income for roughly a billion people. And according to the International Coral Reef Initiative, coral reefs also support billions of dollars in revenue and millions of jobs in over 100 countries around the world. And that's not even including the life-saving medical research and drugs coral reef species have given us. So you can understand why scientists are pretty darn concerned about saving them. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, predicted that with just 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, which could happen in as little as six years, we could lose up to 90% of our coral reef ecosystems. This is truly a tough nut to crack, but not all is lost. Experts believe there is still time to save coral reefs and recover some of what has been lost, but there's quite a bit of heavy lifting that needs to be done. And it needs to be done now. I mean, like, right now. So let's take a look at the tools we have and the solutions we need to implement. Starting with surveillance. While this may sound obvious, in order to know if solutions are working, you first need to know where the world's coral reefs are and be able to monitor them over time. We've never had a cohesive way for scientists to do this until just very recently. The Allen Coral Atlas is the first global map of the world's coral reefs. It's a dedicated platform that merges all of the existing data on coral reefs to give an overall picture of not just where they are, but also how they are faring. Here to talk about it with me is the head of the program, Greg Asner, who notes that even as recently as 2017, this data remained elusive to coral scientists. We, uh, you would think we would have known 
but we really didn't as a community. And so we created the first detailed, dynamic, updated maps of coral reefs and globally. And, and then we, on top of that, put a monitoring system that right now it lets us look at thermal events, coral bleaching, uh, threats to these reefs. And then we also have a marine protected area layer and capability in the monitoring system so that we can see where reefs are protected and where they're not. What we're doing is we're creating kind of a no brainer source where there is no excuse for not knowing what you've got and how it's doing. Other technology aids in this process, such as drones equipped with hyperspectral cameras, which can capture and scan images below the surface of the water. This allows scientists to evaluate the health of individual corals with a simple photo, saving them a substantial amount of time and effort. Experts are using this technology in places such as the Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia. The Ningaloo Reef has been notably more resilient to bleaching events than others. So scientists hope to obtain insights from this reef and use that information to inform interventions elsewhere. However, as Greg states, technology is just the beginning of a larger set of interventions, which no amount of gadgetry alone is going to solve. Saving our coral reefs will require community, government, and scientific collaboration to tackle our damaging ways, which, ironically enough, start, but most certainly don't end, on land. One of the biggest realizations of this decade, you're not going to save coral reefs by working on coral reefs. You're gonna save coral reefs by working on the atmosphere, that's the climate change issue, and land issues. That is how you save coral reefs. And so I've convened and been in meetings that have been convened where the land people have never met the reef people, yet they're in the same government. And so we have to change that quickly so that they're working together. They're seeing the ecosystem as one system, including the human ecosystem. Greg is of course referring to perhaps a less commonly discussed impact to reefs than climate change or overfishing, but it's an impact that affects more than two-thirds of reefs globally, and that is pollution from land. Ubiquitous human waste and agrochemicals that flow into our oceans increase the level of nutrients in the water. This leads to low calcification rates in corals and significantly more algae than a reef can handle, which is why we have more and more reefs that look like this. Coastal pollution really comes down to human effluent and agrochemicals are kind of the two big ones. There's a third one that's related to the disturbance of land generating sediment, which then can flow onto reefs and, reefs and literally cover those reefs. We're seeing all three of those, human effluent, agrochemicals, and sedimentation in different combinations around the planet. And the latest maps show that at least two-thirds of our coral reefs around the world are impacted by these land-based issues. And so when we talk about saving coral reefs, we're really talking about land-based interventions that can be done right now. What are those interventions? Essentially, better waste management across the globe. While that may sound obvious to some, especially in richer countries, you may not know that six in 10 individuals on the planet don't have access to proper sanitation. Think about that, that's around 4 billion people. So what can we do about it? Well, quite a lot. The NGO, the Coral Restoration Alliance, is a great example of one way to address this. With the aid of local stakeholders in Roatan, Honduras, this NGO was able to revive a defunct wastewater treatment facility to significantly improve public sanitation and the rate of coral disease dropped in the area. And healthier coral reefs boosted local tourism as well. In addition, we need to update the outdated infrastructure in wealthy countries as well. Think of Chicago or New York and many cities in the European Union where waste and stormwater sometimes are sent through the same pipes. And of course, reducing our dependence on agrochemicals would certainly help, but so would preventing them from entering our waterways in the first place. One way to do this is agroforestry, which is the use of traditional or indigenous knowledge in farming techniques, often by planting trees alongside a diverse set of crops. It's not just a great way to farm, but it's one of the ways the U.S. state of Pennsylvania is helping clean up the Chesapeake Bay. Through state grants and trees provided by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, this effort will create 86,000 acres of riparian buffers. The trees will be planted by farmers across the state along streams. This will slow the flow of sediments and keep pollutants such as nitrogen and phosphorus 
from entering the water, which can help reduce algae blooms. And it kicks another extra source of income to those farmers to boot. Win-win, anyone? While stopping wastewater from harming our coral reefs is absolutely necessary to save them, it's by no means the only problem we need to address. It's also important to make sure we are protecting the reefs from the impacts in the water, most notably from overfishing. That's where marine protected areas come in. Fish and coral reefs rely on each other. This colorful fish here, for example, spends 90% of his day cleaning algae off coral reefs. Scientists believe that reef health is closely linked to the abundance of the parrotfish, especially in Caribbean waters. Unfortunately, parrotfish numbers have been steadily declining along with many other kinds of fish globally. In 1974, 90% of our global fish stocks were at sustainable levels, but as of 2017, this number dropped to 65% putting reefs at grave risk. More than half of the world's coral reefs today are affected by overfishing and its destructive practices, which can leave behind debris such as nets and traps. An MPA, Marine Protected Area, provides sanctuaries where, depending on the regulations, fisheries and other extractive activities are often banned. MPAs have been found to serve as powerful fish nurseries. One notable example of the success of an MPA is in Ecuador. That reserve actually doubled tuna productivity in the ensuing decade after it was created. The South American nation also recently announced the creation of the Hermandad Marine Reserve, adding 60,000 square kilometers to the existing Galapagos Marine Reserve. Pretty neat, right? However, a blanket ban on fishing isn't exactly a viable choice for every reef community, as many reef fish help provide a significant source of protein for over a billion people worldwide. Of course, reefs also provide economic, social, and cultural benefits to coastal communities, especially to the most vulnerable groups. So what are other ways to protect corals while preserving these livelihoods? There have been successes in managing fisheries by selecting areas where, for example, we call them sources and sinks, where fish are predominantly born, where they're, you know, they, they spend their, their juvenile stages, they mature and then they might move along currents into other areas. Those types of protections of areas of source fisheries need to be protected and, and that will have a positive effect downstream, down current on areas that might be fished. And it's that kind of geography of management that is coming into the limelight now. Better fisheries management along with appropriately enforced laws are seeing success in regions like Palau. The Pacific Island nation decided to prohibit fishing on 80% of its shores while leaving the remaining 20% open to fishing, creating spillover from the protected area to the fishing community. As countries enact such fisheries legislation to protect the reefs we have, one might ask, what about restoring more coral to add onto degraded reefs? A valid question, if there ever was one. Let's take a look at restoration. Every day, it seems like we are seeing news about new and innovative coral reef restoration projects, like these underwater gardens in Jamaica, which use a marine protected area to successfully nurse corals for six to eight months and then replant them to reefs. Jamaica's National Environment and Planning Agency believes the new coral helped increase herbivorous fish populations in less than a decade. Or this project from a group of scientists in Florida that is harvesting small samples of coral that are notably resilient to climate impacts, breeding them off-site in their lab, and then reattaching them to a reef. According to their latest update, the researchers have restored about 100,000 corals to Florida's 350-mile-long reef. All these projects are undoubtedly important, but to what extent are restoration projects a solution? We need to understand how to do it, but really the issue is how do we scale it? And some of the scaling is gonna come through technology. Some of the scaling is gonna come through doing a better job at identifying where to do reef restoration. And I can speak to that one most directly uh, because a lot of restoration has been done without planning well enough to know if those corals are gonna survive, propagate and make other corals. Uh, labor and knowledge. Uh, we are still low in the knowledge, uh, the spread of the knowledge of how to do reef restoration. We don't see it being taught enough across universities. We don't see it being, um, there's a citizen science part to it, but not a lot of leadership science and a lot of leadership management around the world at this point. We need a lot more people doing it. 
Scaling reef restoration up and doing so with the best science is a big challenge, as Asner points out. So while it's not a silver bullet, experts agree that reef restoration is an important and emerging field. It should be implemented around specific goals, including engaging local communities in every step. Most importantly, reef restoration must incorporate adaptive strategies for climate impacts. But when all is said and done, it's going to be difficult to restore coral if we don't actually address the current environmental impacts, and one of them looms larger than all the rest. Spoiler alert, it's climate change. Without a doubt, the, the, the biggest single most important problem for coral reefs is ocean warming, which is driven by climate change. While we don't have enough time here to dissect every climate change solution, it must be emphasized that addressing climate change is crucial to saving coral reefs. And I mean crucial. Climate change is the leading cause of global coral bleaching events, which coral normally need at least 10 years to recover from. But when these events occur back to back due to rapidly warming oceans, it makes it that much harder for recovery to happen. In fact, three major global bleaching events have occurred in less than a 30 year time frame. This was 1997-1998, 2010, and 2014 to 2017. While not all bleaching events are caused by warm water, climate change is undoubtedly behind most. 93% of the heat that's trapped in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean, and this is exacerbating these bleaching events at a pretty rapid pace. Global ocean temperatures have increased for the sixth year in a row, and given ongoing carbon and methane emissions, it's unlikely this is going to change anytime soon. While the effects of climate change are not uniform to every reef on the globe, it does mean there are fewer and fewer safe havens or refugia for reefs to recover from heat waves. A new study published shows that almost all of these havens could be virtually gone with just 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, a number we may hit this decade. With two degrees of warming, these safe zones would be completely gone along with most likely nearly all coral reef ecosystems. This is one of the reasons why scientists say it's so vital to keep our warming to 1.5 degrees and not get anywhere near 2 degrees. Climate change is the elephant in the room. So any efforts focused on maintaining coral reefs may only be effective in the short term if climate change is not addressed. Due to this, experts are strongly encouraging us to help find ways to migrate shallow corals to more hospitable waters through replanting efforts, or even giving corals probiotics called BMCs, which have shown to help alleviate post-heat stress disorder experienced by them. Some researchers like those at the Australian Institute of Marine Science are even breeding heat resistant corals. But for any of these efforts to work, drastically eliminating greenhouse gas emissions is a no-brainer. Aside from aggressively ramping down our emissions, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Ultimately, a combination of tackling climate change, land-based pollution, and overfishing on top of building sound restoration practices is the best way to protect coral reefs from extinction. Such actions are mostly going to depend on how quickly governments and the global scientific community can work together to implement these interventions. So paying attention to what governments are doing while supporting organizations and initiatives that implement rapid action is going to be key to help us make sure that corals don't just survive, but thrive. If you enjoyed Problem Solved, please subscribe to Manga Bay on YouTube, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn, where our handle is at Manga Bay. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.